Okay. So um, let's dive right into um, what is entitled data management and data literacy. And I hope that what I'll also be able to do is um, make the link between this, um, let's say, um, very nice and very inspiring um, keynote that you just heard and go um, in the direction of more practical um, everyday things um, that also Jimena is going to continue on afterwards. So without further ado, um, where do we start? So first of all, everybody knows that we're dealing with um, big data. And uh, there is this, uh, there are these, uh, let's say, comparisons between um, how many bits are out there stored digitally already versus the number of stars um, in the universe. Um, both are huge numbers. I don't know them by heart. You're going to see some of them on the next slide. Um, one important thing to remember here is that big data doesn't necessarily only mean volume. It can also be um, complexity, so different types of data, you're trying to combine different types of data, data that is changing a lot, data that is constantly coming in. Um, so there's um, this concept of the five Vs of big data. I didn't bring a slide on this, but just remember that big data doesn't necessarily only mean volume. It can be very different aspects. Now, Data is, if, if you have a lot of data, you can do a lot of analysis, but you're also going to have a lot of challenges. And uh, first of all, data tends right now to grow at an exponential rate or more than an exponential rate. And um, uh, let's say the number of papers, um, though basically interpretations of the data, if you will, is also growing at, 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 a, at a very uh, uh, fast pace. And what let's say to put a little bit in the number behind it. So at the moment, um, uh, 2018, there's a couple of years back, keep that in mind. Um, um, uh, we we as, uh, uh, as a society generated about 33 zettabytes in, in this year alone. So basically this was newly generated data. And if the term zettabyte is not, um, uh, very common. Um, that's because it roughly amounts to 1 billion terabytes. And that's data generated within one year. year. It's not only science in that case, but um, it's, still, it's still a lot. Now, another problem, oh, that's a duplication that I wasn't <laughs> planning on. Another problem with the data, um, you have a lot of data, you can you have to manage it, that's a big thing. But unfortunately, apparently what happens, and this has already been shown to be true, is that we have a data loss. So the data is being generated, somebody's doing something with it, uh, regardless of how good the papers are, but then the data is degrading and is basically being lost. And this loss has been estimated um, to be about 17% per year. And uh, of course, one of the very well known, uh, known problems is um, the person who produced the data, who was working on the data, was responsible for the data, it's just not available anymore. So you cannot contact the um, person, for example. And this is falling by 7% per year, um, according to this um, study we're citing here. And um, that's a huge rate. So why is this a problem? Um, there are different <laughs> reasons why this is problematic, but I wanted to share some a little bit less common ones. First of all is, um, we're not protecting our own investments. So I usually play this as a game um, when we're teaching, but we don't have so much time. So I'm not going to ask you to guess uh, what is the research and development um, uh, budget in Germany. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, in 2019, it was 142 billion. And that's uh, spread, of course, uh, between academia um, and, um, uh, and companies, yes. Um, a lot of this comes from, from uh, public money. And there is this really nice source called the Funding um, Atlas um, that's compiled by the German Research Foundation, the DFG. And it comes out every three years. So it's basically review and reviewing the past three years. So the last um, installment came out last year in 2021. And then um, it's very detailed. It's very interesting to read, but just as a... a um, in the ballpark is that we have about almost 8 billion euro of third party funding, third party funding, so not the institutional funding, the, um, the general ones, was shared between universities in Germany in 2019. And then you have 
um, the research institutions um, like Helmholtz, um, Max Planck, and so on and so forth on top of these. And you can see all of this in this um, in this atlas. So if you're interested to know how much money is going where in research, um, in, in public uh, publicly funded research, you can get that number from there. So huge investment in, of money, but then it's also investment of time and effort. And that's usually your time and your effort. And there is um, a really <laughs> also an approximation um, based on some um, surveys of how much time and effort goes, for example, into finding data that you need for your analysis and figuring out if you can actually reuse it or not. Does it have the right license? Does it fit my data? Does it contain all the components I need? Um, and there is this nice little survey um, from Barrett Mons, who was one of the uh, main driving forces uh, behind establishing FAIR as an acronym as a term. I think he's the lead author on the, on the FAIR paper that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And um, so they asked basically um, early career, career scientists, so to speak, in the US, how much time they think they, they, they would estimate goes into um, finding and reusing data, and they said about 80%, um, which kind of is almost the same um, about my gut feeling about my PhD back in the day. I would have said 60 to 70%. And this is way too high. So we do have a room for improvement. Now, um, the next couple of topics. So this is a little bit of the motivation about the problems that we want to address by doing best, better um, research data management. So what am I going to show and talk about in the next 30 to 40 minutes? Um, very generally, a little bit about good scientific practice, RDM guidelines, um, some very practical steps of what we um, think that can be done. A little bit about the fair data principles. Um, don't roll your eyes yet. Um, it's going to be, uh, I think, fairly straightforward. So we're not going to go through the detailed tables. And then I'm going to give a very short overview of tools and services that we as NFDI for Biodiversity run um, to help with the research data management um, in the biodiversity, ecological, environmental sciences. And one of these services is the tool that Jimena is going to use uh, for the practical part of preparing a DMP. So that's the plan. Now, the first thing about research data that we know, except that it's now big data, or we, for us, it's a big challenge as, a, as it would be big data, is um, that it's contains, it contains, it basically comprises of anything that has been collected, observed, generated, during research. And this can be really, really, really um, complex and very from very, very different um, types. So you can have measurement documents, lab notebooks, photographs, samples, algorithms, data files, um, multimedia files, um, models, and so on and so on and so forth. So the list is definitely not, um, you can never finish this list, I guess. So it can never be um, absolutely finalized. Um, but I'm pretty sure that you're already aware of this. Now, when we talk about research data, we usually kind of categorize it in um, metadata. We talk about primary raw data and then secondary data. So what do we mean here? Metadata is usually the one that, has, that gets confused very often. It's metadata is basically data about data. So it gives you context, it tells you how to interpret um, the data that you were given or the data that you found. Examples um, could include, for example, naming of the author, um, name or brand of the um, equipment that was used to collate, calibration settings, um, and so on and so forth. What makes metadata very tricky, that's something that's not explicitly on this slide, but I'm speaking from experience here, is that what is metadata and what is data is completely dependent on whom you ask and what field they're from. Uh, and we've seen this uh, very clearly, for example, with molecular sequence data, uh, so DNA sequences, and everything that comes around it. So where was the sample taken? What was the temperature there? And so on and so forth. For somebody um, that is sequence-based, like a bioinformatician like myself, I, I would always say the sequences are the data. Everything else is metadata. If you go and you ask somebody from um, Pangea data publishers, so people that work um, mostly with Earth systems data, they would say, no, 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 no. The author, um, 
the link to the DOI to the paper, that's metadata. And then the measurements of the temperature, that's the data. And then the sequences we don't care about, for example. So it's a point of view. Keep that in mind when you talk to other people, especially from other disciplines. Now, primary data, raw data, that's uh, most of the time rather easy, not always, is the original that was uh, derived from, let's say, a direct observation from a machine. Um, for example, with, if we stay for a moment with that example, sequence data is what comes out of the sequencer. Um, if you're measuring temperature, it's what your thermometer basically said, and so on and so forth. Um, you could have a discussion that sometimes um, there are also different de definitions of what raw actually means, but we're going to skip that for today. That gets uh, way too complex. And then you have secondary data, and this is basically anything that um, has been produced um, as an analysis step from your raw data. So derived, compiled data, selecting, aggregating, after quality control, uh, for example, certain rules, um, documentation, procedures, anything that has been run through a script or something like this. And then you could have also fourth um, category about research information, so administrative information, employees um, running time financing of projects, funding applications, funding numbers. Um, some people might see this as part of the metadata, but um, I'm obliged to mention it explicitly. Now, what is research data management? We don't often define this, but it's a process, first of all, that involves active organization, active, not passive, but things that just happen, or there's another folder there, active organization and maintenance of data throughout the research process, okay? And what it actually does for us is um, that it makes, well, it makes certain, or a good, art, a good research data management um, um, makes certain that the research data will be reproducible uh, and reusable after the project that was, it was generated and is actually finished. That's the, I would say, the gist, the gist. And again, it's an ongoing activity throughout the whole data life cycle. So from planning the experiment until nobody wants to work with the data anymore, but the data is still there, findable and accessible and reusable. Wink, wink. Now, what is um, good scientific practice? So let's define good scientific practice by looking at some very negative examples. Things that could happen in real, li real life, laptop is lost, um, hard drive broken, same time as your only backup is broken, um, editing and troubleshooting the wrong version of things, um, naming your files, and um, basically having completely no overview of what uh, was done when and why. Now, here is a, um, an excerpt from was modified by the research data scary tales from the um, RDM initiative in Thuringia. And I'll shorten this so you can read it, you can read it afterwards. But the short version of this is um, instead of looking at research data, one of the uh, very popular uh, video games and, and very successful video games um, from early on from the early PlayStation era, Final Fantasy. So basically they created the game um, and there is, was this installment that was really, really, really good. And then I continued creating new versions and new versions, but basically the new versions were never as good as the first ones. It happens a lot of times. So the question was, well, why didn't you just, why didn't you just make a new installment of the first one? Why did you, didn't you revive it? And the simple answer is they never archived the original data of, the, of these first versions. I just didn't think about it. It was a quick process. It's like, okay, we have to get the new version out. We have to get the new version out. And then nobody thought about actually um, saving the, the, the data and the results of the, in the beginning. And unfortunately, that's um, something that happens a lot also in science and research. So I posted a comment in the chat before during the, key, <laughs> the keynote is that we are under a lot of time pressure and a lot of insecurities about positions unless you have a permanent position. Um, and then these same kind of scenarios could happen. And then you have a lot of other problems, like a metadata swamp, where you don't know what exactly the metadata is. You don't know how to describe it. Nobody's giving you credit for it. So maybe you just don't do it. Um, the person who actually knows what the data is about is not available anymore for whatever reason. 
Um, you have a standardization form. So everybody's talking about standards. Nobody's really teaching you how to use standards, uh, what they mean. It's, yeah, it gets really tricky and so on and so forth. Now, there are RDM guidelines. Um, and the problem, or let's say the, the status we're in, just a very short history lesson, the guidelines of the German Research Foundation. So it all started in 98, and it's called a safeguarding good scientific practice. But first of all, it was a memorandum, so kind of, you know, memorandum of understanding. So basically, we're shaking hands and we're saying to each other, um, yeah, we both think this is a good idea and we should be doing this, but it's not a binding thing. So it's not like a ring on your finger. And then um, then they become a recommendation the same time 2015, so a couple of years passed. And then at the same time, you also got the guidelines on handling research data and biodiversity research. So that's our background here. Uh, that's why this is, is explicitly mentioned. Um, and then in 19, it became a code of conduct. Um, I'm not really sure how to describe this in terms of how binding this is, but it's 2023, so next year, yay, that these are going to become really binding so that then you might think there will be real consequences if, if you don't abide to them. So it's a, it's a really lengthy um, process that we're looking at um, to make things better. And um, binding, making these binding, of course, means that um, there's going to be a lot of more pressure to actually um, do the work. Hopefully, there will also be credits um, attached to this. This was a big problem, at least in Germany, in some parts of Europe. Um, some other countries did it um, already much better, much earlier. The Netherlands, um, Australia, as far as I'm away, aware of, maybe a couple more basically said, yeah, OK, if you publish your data properly, if you make it fair, if you follow a good data management practice and a plan, you have a much better chance of getting your next funding um, approved. And uh, as far as I know, Australia goes as far as saying, you apply for funding, did you already publish the data from your last project? And if you haven't, you have to explain why, and maybe they'll put your request on hold. Um, we're a couple of steps behind that, unfortunately. But um, the code of conduct, so you will see some of these ideas uh, repeat themselves when we talk about data management plans. It's basically saying, OK, how are you going to handle your research data? How are you going to do long-term archival, open access, reproducibility, and documentation based on standards? Um, all these things that are still a little bit problematic. Now, there's no way to talk about these topics and not mention the fair data principles. So I assume that absolutely everybody has heard, of, heard about the fair data principles and that everybody knows what the acronym is about. Um, I always recommend reading the original publication. It's a really re easy read. It's very well written. It's not too long. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's my recommendation. And uh, it's adopted or the guidelines are adopted by many funding agencies, research organizations. So everybody's writing fair um, in, in their applications. And the idea behind it, I'm going to circle back to this, is the data should be as open as possible and as close as necessary. And you'll see in a second why. Of course, we're not going to go through all the um, different aspects individually. That's going to take too much time. Uh, here are just a few of them are highlighted. So basically, when you talk about findability, uh, you need a persistent identifier like a DUI. Um, metadata is key for finding and for interpreting the data that is um, that you find. And for example, for accessibility, um, metadata should be permanently accessible. What that means is even if for some reason the data is lost or proactively deleted, the metadata should still be there saying there was once a data point that described the following measurement at the following place and time because somebody was looking at this and this and that. So metadata should hopefully live forever. Data optimally as well, but in some cases, um, that's not possible. Then interoperability, um, a lot of what that's required is basically standardization, speaking the same language, using the same ontologies, terminologies. So basically meaning um, you need a definition of what a hill actually means. Because if I in Bremen say a hill, that means something completely different to a person in Bavaria, simply because they have a different landscape outside their windows. 
And last but not least, reusability, um, or as uh, what how Michael Diepenbrock from Pangea um, propagated fitness for reuse, uh, fitness fit for purpose, data need to be fit for purpose, because it will always depend on what you're trying to do with the data, if you can actually reuse them. But one big point is a usage license. So basically Creative Commons, for example, um, if it's data, if it's software, it becomes a little bit different. Uh, provenance, so where's the data coming from, how it was produced, and yeah, this keeps repeating itself, um, but community standard. One of the things I like to do very much is um, to talk about what FAIR is not to get to a better understanding of what FAIR actually is. So simply put, um, FAIR is not a standard, at least not yet. So it's, um, uh, it, th those are guiding principles. Okay, so please don't talk about a standard. If somebody says a set, says standard, fair standard to you, ask them if there's really one already developed. I'm not aware of one. Hopefully I didn't miss a memo there, but um, that's important. Fair is not the same as open data. Remember a couple of slides ago, it said um, as open as possible and as close as necessary. That basically means uh, if you have collected data on the last, or the last few remaining um, representatives of an endangered species, and you publish that data completely open, um, most probably the next day, somebody will go there and uproot that species and bring it home for whatever reason. And that's why um, good data publication in cases like this would mean metadata will probably be public. So it will be known to everyone that you collected data on these endangered species and why, but it will not include their exact location, for example. And uh, most of the data archives and data centers I know and work with will do exactly this. So they say, okay, we cannot publish the exact, or we should not publish the exact location. And um, this idea was already mentioned um, today in the keynote. I don't know if you um, remember this, there was a lot of information already. Um, next point is that FAIR is not only meant for humans, but it's also not meant for machines. So basically, when you talk about FAIR data, you should be able to find the data, you should be able to interpret the data, you should know what license it has. That should be exactly true for both humans and machines. So you can imagine it like this. If you're searching for data, you should be able to open a, like a regular data search that you know, <laughs> even if it's Google. and um, search for your data, see what license it has and say, okay, I want to have only um, data that is under Creative Commons and has certain parameters and so on and so forth. A machine should be able to do exactly the same. And fortunately, until now, machines are still a little bit, um, as no, are not as um, smart as we are. Let's hope it stays that way, um, but it should, be, it should be possible for them to do the same. FAIR is not only for life sciences. The original team that wrote up the paper that made FAIR so famous is mostly um, from uh, the bios, com comes from the bio background, but they managed to write it in a way that is so um, discipline uh, agnostic that can be applied, uh, I think, to all disciplines, and it can be applied also beyond data. So we also talk about FAIR software um, and FAIR protocols and whatnot. And last but not least, FAIR is not the same as RDF, um, Resource Data Framework, Linked Data, or Semantic Web. Those are all different um, frameworks um, or uh, technologies that can be applied to um, increase the fairness of data, but it's not exactly the same. And I just realized that I missed one point, which is fine, I can circle back to this. Fair is not a quality, but a quantity. So it should not be or it cannot be, is it fair or is it not fair, but is it fairer or less fair? Um, that's a distinction we, oh, for the moment, we need to keep in mind. Now, um, going away a little bit from this um, general part, uh, I wanna talk very shortly about the um, NFDI and uh, present a little bit about the services that um, that we offer to support research data management. And then you'll see why we're gonna talk, oh, your, yeah, we'll make the transition then to talking specifically about a um, 
the data management um, planning support that we offer. And um, from there on, we'll go into the practical, oh, Humana will go into the practical part. So 10 second water break. The NFDI, I'm guessing that a lot of you have already heard about this um, in German, Nationale Forschungsdaten Infrastruktur, um, in English, and translates to um, National Research Data Infrastructure Germany. And um, I'm going to keep this very short and try to focus on the services. But um, the idea behind this whole process, and it was also a lengthy process getting to this National Research Data Infrastructure, is that you have in Germany, we have a very um, complex landscape of where data is generated, how it's handled, uh, what is done with it. And then the most important part um, to remember at this point is that you have the, um, let's say, the usual players like universities and um, research organizations. But let's not forget the repositories. You have infrastructure providers and professional societies, so learned societies, for example. Um, those are the people that have a regular day job, and then in their free time, they go out and they count, um, for example, dragonflies or birds or some kind of insects. They describe new species even and are actually really experts um, on these individual groups uh, without actually working for a university or research organization. Um, and they have amazing, um, amazing data sets in there. And of course, um, last but not least, we have discipline specific services. So something exactly what I'm going to show you in about two to five minutes. Um, we've been setting up, setting this up for the last almost 10 years now. So, and we have to bring all of this uh, together in the sense that the problems we're trying to address is this data is stored decentrally. So you have all these different data gems spread out across different institutions, different places. Um, different formats, different standards, uh, which means it's not always stored forever, or at least not all of it. Um, there's different metadata, so it's not always comparable. And some of the data undergoes much more rigid um, data quality uh, approval than others. So there are differences all um, there, which means it's getting very, very hard to know, can I combine these two or three data sources um, or my analysis. So where do we want to go from, from here is basically our hope is that with the national research data infrastructure, what we can do is um, kind of create some nice links between all these layers of different data. So if you go from, from, from the top, so remote sensing um, down to really um, the classical sampling of taking water samples, taking sediment samples, uh, counting bees, counting trees, and whatnot, and um, find a way to put all put, put a link um, between all of it, so that at the end um, we can actually address um, biodiversity questions, for example, much much better. Now, biodiversity is not the only um, topic that is. Uh, addressed within the National Research Data Infrastructure. So um, unfortunately, the slide is yet a couple of days old, which means uh, it doesn't have the newest consortia on it. So if you're part of a consortium that's not in here, I'm very sorry, I didn't manage to um, update the, the names. But basically, um, the NFDI works in a way that um, there is around 90 million euro per year, and that's distributed across um, 26, 20, 28 consortia in total, and all of them started in three different waves. So we were lucky to uh, start with the third wave, uh, with the first wave, and the third wave just got their um, uh, funding approval, and they know they're going to start beginning of next year. And that means um, that there's more than 200 organizations working on this, and the number of professional staff that's going to be hired in the end. Uh, for this is going to be above a thousand, so it's a huge undertaking. But um, getting down to business, so NFDI for biodiversity, so our consortium within the NFDI is basically focused on making sure that stakeholders from science, but also politics and nature conservation can get reliable data to basically make 
really good informed decisions that affect uh, conservation of global diversity in the right way. And we do this by a huge network um, of partners um, from many different uh, from many different fields. So basically, we cover all this um, diversity of where data is coming from, where it is stored, and we try to make really data um, available and comparable and reusable. But the topic right now, the last five minutes, is not going to be how we do this. So we're not going to go into the technical details. But what do we offer in order to make this, um, let's say, uh, work on an everyday basis for the researchers at least? So most of these tools and services at the moment are based are aimed at um, people doing research. But we are adding also tools that are um, definitely aimed at the general public, the learned societies, and so on. Now, what I did here is um, so this is the list or a graphical representation of the services. And the two colors um, mean the following. The green ones are the services that we already have in production because we had this um, eight year, eight and a half year um, project called GFBio, the same as the um, association that I worked for um, together with Daniel and Jimena and a few others here today. So these are uh, services that are already in production, they're working. You can just go and use them uh, if, if they fit your needs. And the ones that were left blue are the ones that we are adding um, in addition as part of the NFDI for biodiversity. So very shortly, uh, we have service for submitting data. Um, we have a general help desk, which means any kind of question you have, you want to have a roadshow, you want to have a training um, workshop on some topic, you can just fire off an email and then Daniel will take care of it. Uh, <laughs> So we have um, so we have a lot of partners and we have a lot of association members, institutional association members that are long lasting data centers. So um, they do the long term archiving and curation. So they help people integrate and harmonize and harmonize data. We have education and training, obviously, as we can see of today. So this is something that's been running for a couple of years. We have a terminology service. Remember when I said we have to speak the same language. So um, use the same terms, use the same definitions for terms. So you can browse, you can add new ones in there. And of course, it's all about the data. So yes, we have um, services to not only gather the data, put it into long-term archiving, but also get it out, um, make it searchable in a unified in a unified way. So all of this is working. And right now we're also um, going in the direction of collaborative workspaces. So Think about um, Jupiter, something that you're going to get in touch uh, with um, the next couple of days. Uh, basic tools for data managers, hopefully, um, well, not hopefully, but there we're paired up with the German network for bioinformatics, Denby. And they're also a long running um, project and framework, and they have a lot of these tools already available. So now we're into the process of reviewing and integrating those um, and then start offering those also through the same um, through the same way that we do uh, with the rest and a little bit of elastic compute services so if somebody's interested in just running their own pipelines on a cloud and don't know where to start we should be able to help um, as I said a lot of these are already running so if you want to have a look um, you can go to nfti for biodiversity.org and um, you can follow the uh, the link to select the service. So at the moment, this is going to lead you to our GFBio um, website, simply because rebranding the whole thing is a is a huge undertaking. We don't want to lose any existing customers, and um, that they get the feeling, oh, this this is now ended, and it's something completely different now. So bear with us until all the logos are exactly the same, and NFDI for biodiversity, but services work exactly the same as before. So I, as I said. A help desk and you have two possibilities of course you can write to nfdi for biodiversity that's mostly used for collaboration um, requests but uh, if you need a question about a service um, you can write also to info at gfbio.org at the end it doesn't matter it all goes into the same system um, Jimena, who's going to talk next is our um, dispatcher so she sees everything and knows who can help you um, the best and then you're going to get an answer. And um, if we need even more help, we can involve other people from the consortium, like a second level support 
that works out pretty well. What you're going to see and take a deep dive in today is the DMP support. So I'm not going to spend so much time on this, but um, the very basic of it is you can fill out a form that asks you a lot of questions about biodiversity data handling that's based on the DFG uh, recommendations. And you can go and use that if you want, but you can also ask for personalized support. And you're going to get this. We already have an example out there that uh, you can have a look how your DMP might look like at the end um, if you go this way. But I'm going to let him in. I'll give you all the details on that as well. So we have collaboration workbenches or data management workbenches and tools um, for doing things locally. So this is done by um, two of our partners and association members. So if you're looking for a system to manage your data locally, um, you might look into BEXIS or Diversity Workbench, depending on your um, uh, what you need. And of course, um, our colleagues will be happy to assist you making the decision and um, let's say giving you a little bit of help setting up. Uh, the, the data submission service that I mentioned, so this was my hobby horse for the last eight, nine years. I built this together with a colleague of mine. And the idea is that you can um, fire off a very complex data submission to a single place. And in most cases, what we'll do is, or in some cases, what we'll do is if you have a really different data in there, I'm gonna say, okay, let's split this up. So for example, sequence data um, goes to European Nucleotide Archive, but environmental measurements should go to Pangea. If you have some observation data or even some really objects that you collected, it goes, this goes into one of our collection data centers. And you've got to get a DOI for all of these. Um, and you can cite them individually, but we also create a link between the different records so that you can follow the breadcrumbs um, between the different parts of your um, data output, so to speak. And just to get an idea, um, this is the list of um, the data centers uh, that we work with. At the moment, I have the feeling that we're actually missing one uh, in there. The list is growing slowly but steadily, and they do the long-term archival and most of the curation. So Jimena mostly and I do the curation for the sequence data uh, before we deposit it in ENA because ENA is not a direct partner. It's just a, a, a long-standing collaboration with them. We do have a data portal. So basically all the data that we put in in one of these um, data centers, uh, we collect the metadata again, and we present it in a unified way. So basically you can go to the GFBio search and say, okay, I'm looking for um, data on a certain species and then it won't matter. Uh, I mean, you can get results, for example, from one of the collection data centers, you can get also results from Pangea and you can get results from ENA, provided the metadata that was put in there is um, contains this name, of course, and then um, you can collect different, different types of data through the same, through the same interface. Of course, I mentioned this um, terminology service. Um, you can, um, let's say, it has. You can browse it, but it also has an API. Almost all the services we offer have an API. It can be used um, also in um, by machines, so it can be used programmatically. So you can um, integrate them into your own um, data management systems if you have them. And one thing uh, I left out before is that we also um, prepared a data integration and analysis um, tool that's GIST based, so basically all about geo referenced um, data. So you can take your search results, you can import your own CSV file, and then start putting layer on layer upon layer upon layer of um, um, data. And you have some predefined functions that you can use. Um, and if that's not enough, you can download the whole thing and continue working in R, Python, uh, Julia, whatever. Um, your preferred languages. Of course, last but not least, training as much as possible. So um, different formats, so you can have a roadshow, you can have workshops, um, some other type of dedicated trainings. Of course, some are winter schools like this one. Um, the best thing is always just um, get in touch with us and um, say what you would like to have, what, what you need, uh, what you struggle with, and then we're gonna find a solution. Exactly. So that's, all on my part. I hope I stayed more or less in the time frame that I promised. I would like to hand over to Jimena then. Okay, thank you, Ivo. Uh, good morning, everybody. 
Yes, I'm happy to join the, the session. As Ivo was mentioning, today or in this part of the session, we are going to focus mainly in the data management plans. As you see here, they are written as DMPs. So that is the abbreviate, abbreviation for it. But before getting to data management plans or data management planning, which they are a component of, it would be worth it to also uh, get to know a little bit about the data life cycle. And this is what we are going to do as well. So what we have is a data life cycle will involve your everyday practice as long as you are doing research and you have your data. And this is the way it's going to uh, work. So um, it could be defined by a conceptual tool. It's also as a cycle that your data will follow from the generation until the creation of your knowledge. Could be at the end, for example, the publication. <clears throat> the data sharing and reuse begins with good data practice. And all the phases of this, this data life cycle that we see, as we see here, at 10, usually around 10 steps. Um, it is important to know that an idea an ideal um, data life cycle is composed by these steps, such as planning, collection, organization um, of data, and quality assurance and quality control, metadata creation, um, creation preservation, data discovery, integration, analysis, and visualization of data, and of course, publishing. Um, however, in real life, it is implemented differently. And this depends on the relationship between the researcher and the research project and the data. Uh, but what we try to do in the GFBio is to focus into uh, the data producer, the relationship between data producer and data reuser, which is the most common one. Um, it's very common that the data life cycle is not um, realized as part of the research project, which is a pity. And this realization might, um, change according to the type of research you're doing, the type of data that you are collecting, and also the type of researcher. And we have identified in, in our group uh, four scenarios of the data life cycle based on the type of researcher. I'm sorry. If you are the data producer or if you are the data user, or you can be both. So please do feel free to explore the animation that we have in our training section in our GFIO website. Uh, we can share the link. Uh, perhaps Daniel, can you share the link in the in the chat? In any case, okay. So um, each of these ten steps that I have just mentioned that you get to see here again, it also has um, components or elements that you should bear in mind. Today I will mention them, each of them, very shortly. But at the end of the day, or towards the end of the this session, the idea is that we all focus in the planning step, so the very first one, which is the one that involves the DMP, the data management plan. <clears throat> okay, so first step in the data life cycle is planning. What is the planning? So the planning involves everything that you should bear in mind for your research. And um, the main thing that you can have for your planning or, or the, the main result or component would be for you to create the DMP, the data management plan. The DMP is simply a document that is formalized and where you're saying, what are you going to do with your data after, during and after your project? You, ideally, you begin to, to write your data management plan before you are applied for funding. Um, and it will help you to design, to put into practice, and to follow up how your research data are collected, how your research data are organized, how is it, uh, are they used, and how are they going to be looked after in order for you to achieve the highest quality and the long-term sustainability of your data and, of course, your research. Um, a DMP currently is part of your proposal, so please do consider a DMP and the cost to make a, or your DMP and also your data management in general in your research proposal. In many, ca many cases, you can apply for funding just for the sake of managing your data, uh, saying that you are going to create a data management plan in your proposal. And this is, for example, a very common practice here with the German Research Foundation, the DFG. So they will, they will help you with the cost for the planning. Um, one thing that... Uh, Sometimes uh, we tend to forget is the benefit of the, the data management plan for a project. So we are uh, tend to underestimate it. But uh, 
actually is, is very useful, not only for our planning, but for future planning and for organizing our work, our research. So please do take it as a living document. Try to update it regularly during your project time. And it's going to help you along your project and for the creation of new uh, data management plans as well. Why you should write it? Well, the first answer, you, you won't believe it, but it actually saves you time in the long run for your research project. Uh, with a plan, you already know or have an approximation of the data you will be dealing with and how to handle it. It will facilitate you the long-term preservation and access to your data sets. And it will allow you to safeguard your research. Um, it will make it also possible for other researchers to discover, to interpret, and to reuse your data, which not only allows to make new discoveries, but also to increase the visibility of your own research. So it's also beneficial for you. Um, a DMP would help you also to clarify the cost uh, for data publication and archiving, and also which access conditions uh, to your data uh, you want to, to provide. And we will see about that a little bit later. And mainly also you should write one because it helps you to meet the grant requirements. So a growing number of funding agencies, journal publishers, and research institutions require a specification how your data is going to be produced, how your data is going to be archived and shared. So in other words, um, most funding applications now require for you to make a data management plan or a similar document as part of your planning. So requested and needed. Um, to begin with, um, a good data management plan is a very good example of teamwork because you need the expertise uh, of your colleagues uh, that are experts in different subjects. And this is very important to have in mind. You don't have to be the one that writes it all and knows it all. Please rely on your colleagues. Please, please rely on the IT department in your institution. Many institutions offer research data management support or have a research data management de um, department. So uh, just in quest, check, and uh, you will have support from others to write yours. Um, an ideal data management plan should cover the main aspects that we have here. And I would like to dive into them. So basic checklist. So the eight aspects you see, and now we are gonna see how this checklist is represented in the different parts of, the, of a DMP. So the very first part of your DMP, no matter <clears throat> Uh, the structure that you use to write it, it should always be the basic information about your project. Um, if we could split expli a DMP in different parts, then we will use the six parts, around six categories. And, um, and the, one, the first one always will be the basic information you provide about your project. So here you have to specify who is doing the planning. So who is creating also a data management plan? Who is the principal investigator? If it's not you, who is the project contact and the funding application. So um, this usually will involve every data producer and data reuser that is integrating secondary data or creating own data within uh, the research project or a partner in a research program. So where should you go to and what is your project uh, title? Then we have the second part. Here you go more into detail. And here it's all about the project focus. So what is your motivation for data collection? And this should be included in a short abstract of your project. What is important here is that your DMP answer two basic questions. What do you mean to find and how you're meaning to find it? By providing this information in a short abstract, you'll be stating the importance of your project. And this should be clear for every single person that reads your DMP, provided if they are an expert on your, on your, on your topic or not should be understood. Ah, this is what this person is planning to, to obtain, and this is how this person is going to do it. Try to make your abstract not so long, uh, mainly uh, make it concise, but very clear. And then we go to the third part, which is where we have uh, the relevant policies and guidelines that you will follow. It's important that because uh, a DMP is a formal document, so therefore you have to declare that you will for, follow certain uh, policies and guidelines. Um, for example, if you are doing your research project in an institution, you will find them in the website of your institution which guidelines or in research data management they may have. Or if you're relying on a funding agency, you will also find the information there as well. 
And there are basic guidelines that you will follow. For example, if your project is funded by the DFG, so the German Research Foundation, the German Research Foundation, as Ivo mentioned, um, they, they, will, they will provide you with the guidelines or you will find a list of the guidelines if their website according to the subject or to the field of the study that are relevant for your research. Um, for biological and biodiversity research, they usually rely on three particular guidelines that you should declare that you will follow in your DMP if you're doing biological or biodiversity research. Now we go to the fourth part, which is all about the general data management. Here you discuss um, the data collection, the data handling. So for example, the identifiers, you will do a metadata description and will name the standards that you will follow and the data types that you are uh, planning to produce and the formats. Ivo was uh, shortly mentioning um, uh, data types such as uh, observational data types or experimental, but do remember also you have raw or derived meta types. You may have physical collections. You also may have models and also the inputs of these models. Uh, simulation outputs, software is also data, images, of course. And then as for formats, uh, please try to think or always try to go for open formats such as CSV, XML, PNG, HTML, doc, text, oh well, um, et cetera. Or if you're dealing with images or multimedia, of course, you will go to GPG or a PDF. Um, you also should uh, consider the information about your data volume and the number of data set of each data type you are expecting to collect and provide approximation of the total data volume of your project. Just an approximation, you don't have to be punctual, but getting to know uh, the approximation of your data volume would also help you to know where are you planning to archive your data and if will they take all this amount of volume you are about to produce. Please do also mention if you are working with partners, how is the data exchange with your partners and the backup and storage of the data during your whole project. Um, regarding the particular point of expected data types, then uh, the idea here is that you provide a list of the data types. And as I mentioned before, estimate the data volume you expect per data type and for the whole project. I couldn't emphasize this more enough because it's vital for uh, the following steps in your, in your data management plan. And you also describe here how you want to handle this data, as I mentioned, also very important. And also important to repeat data exchange and backup and storage. How are you going to deal with that? And this you do in this part. And then we reach the fifth part of your data management plan, <clears throat> which is all about archiving, publication, and licensing. So if we think about archiving, then you should start early thinking about your archiving. Uh, you can also get in touch, for example, with the database or the curators, and uh, you have to find a suitable uh, archive or repository for your research data. Um, there are common repositories where you can uh, rely on so um, to, to submit your data according to the subject. Uh, you can also request the journal where you're planning to submit uh, your, your paper to recommend you some databases or some repositories and some of the common ones that you use, for example, in, uh, in general in science would be re3data.org. Or if you want to be fair, you can also go more fair. You can also go in direction fairsharing.org. Those are good examples of open science tools where you can have an overview of existing international repositories for different types of research data and get a little bit of information. And eventually you can also put oh, send uh, your data there. When it comes to publication, uh, you should ask uh, yourself the following questions. For example, uh, and this was mentioned early this morning in, uh, in, 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 in the last two sessions. Should you publish your data with your paper? Yes or no? Do you publish all your data? Or is there any sensitive data that will not be published? Do you need a persistent identifier for your data, for example? Or where will you publish your data? Um, please do consider, that, of course, your data can be kept private until it is published, or that you can ask for it to be released. So whatever occurs first is possible. However, do remember that the goal is to make your data fair. Therefore, please do consider to share your data and uh, use open access publications. And when it comes to licensing, uh, 
well, licensing is important for the reuse of your data. You uh, should consider to find the right license. Not all licenses are apply for all data types. To make sure your data can or cannot be reused in the way you want, you have to consider the right license. For example, if you publish on their data, um, your data under Creative, Creative Commons license or the CC license, it is easier to reuse your data. And there are different types of Creative Commons licenses which you can explore. And for that, you can totally, I mean, check um, the Creative Commons website, for example. If you are not sure about which license fits your data better because you're working with software or with simulations or models, perhaps here Creative Commons is not the ideal one because this type of data have uh, particular licenses that they will follow, then you can also ask the data specialists in your institution, your colleagues, or also uh, ask us, the GFBio, to, pro to provide you some, some help uh, regarding the license that you can use for uh, different data types uh, that you will produce during your research. And the very last part is all about the cost. Um, here you ideally estimate the cost for publishing, for backup and for archiving of your data. You could ask the curators, for example, of the archive or the data specialists at your institutions to provide you with these values and approximation or with some support. Uh, the information from the first five parts of the data management plan will help you out to get to know which cost um, you will need to consider or, or estimate. And of course, there are some other factors or activities or process that make up for the cost of data management. And this should also be considered in your data management plans. For example, if you have to buy software, that is also cost. Uh, if you need to rely on external hard drives, if you need to do training of employees for software operation, if there is some server hosting, a software licensing also has a price, backup, curation, archiving, and of course, publication. All of these are costs that add up for a uh, research data management. Um, that said though, this is the, the last part of the data management plan. And I think the best way to get to know about something is to actually take the time to read and, and explore it. And this is why we will recommend you to have a look at our um, GF Bio model data management plan. So uh, an example of how a data management plan would look with all these um, components just mentioned. And um, in case you're, you're wondering how does a finished and complete DMP uh, looks like, you can have a look at the model. Perhaps, uh, Daniel, could you please uh, share the link of the DMP model? Thank you so much that you can explore. Um, yeah, this is just um, pretty much if you can scan this image. But if not, of course, the link will be provided in the chat. Thank you so much, Daniel. Okay, and um, what time is it? Okay, we still have some time before the lunch break. That was all about the first plan, which is planning and the data management plan. And this is the part that we are going to explore later after lunch. But as I mentioned, we're going to also mention the data life cycle, all the steps. So we are done with step one. Let's go to a step two and three. So when it comes to collection, documentation, and quality assurance, Please do consider um, systematic naming convention for your trials, your samples, and your variables. So for uh, your research data, the way you are collecting it, how are you going to document it? Um, consider standardized sampling protocols or software if there is some software available to help you out with that. Predefine the names of the output files from measuring devices. And um, Instantly document relevant metadata information and systematic and consider folder structure is also very important to assure that uh, you comment, your documentation is clear and can be understood by other of your colleagues. You could also create readme files where you are stating what is the naming convention, what are the protocols, and, and, and of course some recommendations so everyone uh, that gets access um, into your data can, can understand what you're talking about and what is this uh, naming for. When it comes to file and folder naming, please always try, but this is a, a practice in, in general, <laughs> is keep files name short, so a maximum of 32 characters will do it, but also keep them descriptive. Try to use abbreviations and acron acronyms consistently. This is very uh, important to keep <clears throat> all along your research uh, 
you research and, and for the old data produced before, during, and after. Try to use um, ASCII characters, which is the, the shortcut for American Standard Code for Information Exchange, uh, Information Interchange, which is a character encoding standard widely used for folder naming, so applied. Please try to avoid spaces or full stops and special characters such as the ones that we see, or regarding to your uh, native language, which could make it confusing for the file folder naming and understanding and for others. If you are using sequential numbering, please use leading zeros as you see in the example. And in case you need to rename files, if you have the possibility, of course, please rely on use renaming software such as bulk or rename utility Y. Um, well, we are only humans and we can make mistakes. So uh, renaming or changing things manually have, uh, may have this tendency for you to be mistaken. While if you rely on a software, this, um, this risk is reduced. And here is an example uh, of how you could uh, name your file of your folder, um, as I just mentioned before. Uh, important here also is uh, if you're managing dates in your naming, please be careful which date uh, in the way that you are going to share it. Are you going to do it as the general uh, European way, which is year, months, and days? Or are you going to, I'm sorry, are you going to use the American way, which begins with the month, the day, and then the year, which could be confusing? This too is something that you should also bear in mind. When it comes to version control, uh, please do keep the original version of the data file. Uh, the same and save it. Do not touch it, keep it safe. And from there, you just make copies and work on them. Establish a consistent convention and document it. So what is the file history? What is the version uh, or having a version table would help you. And if you rely on software, a version control software such as Git would help you out to keep the history of all the versions you have been uh, creating. Try to avoid labels that can be confusing for others, such as uh, intermediate or final. What is final at the end of the day? Uh, you don't know, nothing is even really finished to a point. And also please try to keep ordinal numbers for major version changes and decimal numbers for minor changes or dates in case you want to distinguish between successive versions. But remember what we mentioned just before about dates. So try, try your dates to be uh, to keep the steady so they can be understood. And this is, of course, another example. And here, if you see the second one, then we're using the dates, uh, the European or the extended way. Then we have the uh, describe and submit about your data. So what is it? Well, it's important to say or to describe your data in the right way so it can be understood the way you want it. And here we have a nice example provided by the colleagues before um, about this elephant, which seems in the first image, if you see it, it seems like a functional elephant. But then you have uh, different colleagues uh, having a different uh, definition of what they get to see. Is it a wall? Is it a rope? Is it a fan? Uh, and then in the second image, you see what is on the back of the elephant. You have different parts, but what parts you have then? What is composing it? And what matters at the end, this is for the third image, that the parts can make it look like an elephant. But what matters here is like they making then um, function that way is the next step. If these parts can make it <laughs> work, uh, this structure, this as an elephant, then they did, they reached their goal. And it's important for you then to use standard methodologies whenever possible and available. And terminologies, of course. So define what is what and um, using formalization and using consensus. So everyone knows what are you talking about. And for this, it's important, of course, to rely on metadata. As Ivo mentioned before, metadata is the data that describes data. There's many ways to define metadata, but at the end of the day, it's just providing more data about your data. Um, there's other ways to define uh, metadata, but what matters is that you think, how do you want to describe the original data that you created, you're providing? This metadata, metadata is extremely valuable and it really gives a value to your data because it facilitates the search at the retrieval of your data when you put it, for example, in a, deposit, in a data repository and also improves the use of your data. 
having good metadata in your research can really make up for human failures. So uh, we as humans um, forget and misplace things. We leave research projects, taking our knowledge of the research methodology and the data with us. So having metadata, it will ensure that others will be able to find, to use our data and our data can be preserved and also reused in the future. So our data could be fair if we keep a metadata uh, structure there. What is also important about metadata? Well, um, think about how you're planning to find the data, use the data and reusing the data. Um, metadata can uh, or should be, and this is also an important thing to consider in mind, that is uh, you need to explain in a way that also can be machine readable. Right now, this is a challenge, um, but, uh, but it should be ideally the ultimate goal. So it can be also exchanged and discovered by machines as well, and therefore allowing others to discover your data. When you think about your metadata, just formulate yourself the following questions. Who created the data? What is the content of this data? When were the data collected? Where were the data collected? And how were the data collected? So these are the basic questions that the metadata should answer about the data you just collected. If you are answering these questions, then you are collecting good metadata. Um, this could also include content such, uh, for example, the contact information, geographic locations, uh, de details about the units of measurement that you use, abbreviation or codes that you use in your database, uh, the provenance and version information, and much more. If you are working in a lab setting, which is quite common, then much of the content used to describe your data is already collected in your notebook. If you are on the field, you also collected this data in your notebook. So keep your, uh, your notebook with you at all times. And as Ivo defined before in a very similar slide, uh, please do remember that, of course, primary data are the original data that are derived, uh, derived from your research. Um, however, secondary data are the ones that are derived from your primary data. As he also mentioned, we have um, difficulty to make a distinction between what is primary and what is secondary. And sometimes this line is very blurred and very unclear. Uh, when you are in doing conducted research, you will collect and create both types of research data. But do not let yourself to get disappointed. Just collect your data, have it written somewhere. And eventually you can define, oh, okay, is this data or is this metadata? And as for examples, for example, we'll have descriptive metadata. And in this case, it could be considered, for example, as the, uh, the title, the author, and the abstract. So as you see here, it's not data itself, it's just descriptive metadata associated to another uh, primary data. You can also have administrative data in which you are pointing out what are the rights management, the access rights, or the storage. And of course, you could have structural and um, technical metadata also related to, for example, a structural to uh, the sections, the structure, the files, or even the version that you have this is also metadata, which version you are using or producing. And technical, as I mentioned, um, is related to, to technical characteristics such uh, coding, scope, and the formats that you are using. So in other words, metadata is data about the data, but also it could be anything. So bear that in mind and just collect it and have it written. That's what matters, that you have it collected and you have it written. Don't lose it, even when you have uh, data that you collected that it doesn't seem to have sense for you at this point of your research, don't forget about it. Keep it in a file. Eventually, you might get back to it. It, it might be very valuable. What is important then about uh, metadata? Well, your metadata should summarize the basic information about your data in a very structured way so it could be understood to make your data comprehensible, as we said, but also machine readable. If you look at this example, this is a very good example for exa yeah, example, <laughs> or how you are setting metadata and the way that you are structuring for others to follow and understand. Um, there are certain uh, types of um, structuring for metadata, also in biological science, of course. And one of these examples uh, could be here, the one that we see that is the Darwin core. So the idea here is like, when possible, structure your data using an appropriate 
agreed upon metadata standard format. If there is already one existing like this one here that we call the rely on it. Because in order to be useful, your metadata needs to be standardized. Otherwise, every person will come with a different type of metadata, and it would be very difficult to uh, for others to get to understand what you were meaning. And eventually, it would be difficult for you. This is why it's so important to follow a standard. This also implies agreeing on a language, on a spelling, on a date format, as we saw before. Um, all of these to allow comparison and understand, uh, understanding of your data. Here is an example of the format used for the Darwin core, which is the one that follows that is XML. And if you look at what is written in black, then you will get an idea. Ah, okay, this is the metadata and those are the values. So it still can be understandable for you, for the machine, and for others. There are certain common uh, standards in um, the science schema. So you will have ABCD, Access for Biological Collection Data. You will have um, well, it's not here, but it's also very common, ETS, that is Ecological Trade Data, uh, EML, which is Ecological Metadata Language, and this one in particular is specific to Earth, Environment, and Ecological Science. Um, what matters is that all these standards are based on work done before and associated efforts, so there is consensus uh, in the community about these standards. Tomorrow you will learn more with Birki about um, certain standards, so I will just gonna leave it until here. Okay, next step is preservation. Um, I'm just gonna put it very simple. Whenever possible, use open file formats to guarantee the preservation. Do you remember the accessible part of fair? Here is where you need it. So think about the type of data you are collecting. For example, let's go to text data, the second one, the second row, and then you will see uh, open file formats that you should consider when you are collecting this text data. So consider text, HTML, RTF, or TXT, open file formats that can be used by everyone and without, um, let's say, a restriction and also understood. If it's images, of course, you can rely on uh, TIFF or GPEG. And the same applies for tabular data and structured data. So which type of data do you have or you're planning to produce? And then think which open file format will apply for it? That is the question. <clears throat> then uh, we'll have storage and preservation of your data. This is also part of the, of course, the preserve step. But this is important here to make a, a fine distinction between, between what is storage and what is preservation. Storage refers to the mid-term preservation of your data or storaging of your data. So it happens during your active process phase. It happens in your local computer and hopefully also in a server or in another um, media that you are using. And you can rely on the institutional cloud storage for the storaging of this data you are collecting. For this, you should follow, or we recommend to follow, the three to one rule for data backup. This means always keep three files of your data, including, of course, the original copy, in addition to a minimum of two backups, uh, which are locally, but please do try to consider storing in different devices, so in different storage types locally. And because there is always a possibility of an on-site disaster that could quickly wipe locally all your stored information, you should also consider backup your data to a, or an off-site location or in a cloud. So there is no way you will lose your data. You already save it three different times in three different places. So you keep it during your project. However, if you want to keep your data for long term, so you want to preserve your data, the idea here is that your data will be kept as it is, so it aims for integrity. And for this, you can rely in long-term repositories that have curators behind that, helping with the routines of doing the curation of this data. It's a good scientific practice that uh, your research data should be uh, preserved for a minimum of 10 years. So try to enter four repositories that will offer that to you. Uh, some of them will be uh, offered this automatically uh, without cost related, but sometimes you may have to pay for that. Also, it depends on the data volume that you are collecting. This is why we mentioned before for the data management plan, how important it is to, to get an approximation of the data volume. And do please consider, of course, accessibility, authenticity, and longevity. 
So try to aim for preservation, but in the meantime, it's in your hands to take care of the storage. And then we have the three steps that I will mention very quickly. This one, so we have the discovery stage. That is where um, you search for available data that might be available and usable for your own study or your research project. Um, in order for you to discover data and their metadata related, they should be already be visible and accessible. So that means somebody already submit, submitted this data to a data infrastructure, call it an archive, a data center, and this data has already, and ideally, a persistent identifier, so you can discover it. When it comes to integration, uh, it's a very common practice as well that uh, in integration, you are merging multiple data sets from different sources. Uh, for example, you will have the data that you just uh, recently collected that you can integrate to form more data from other owners or also from yourself, from, from yourself, which will result in a new bigger data set. And when it comes to analysis, um, you analyze your data to gather information from a single or an integrated data set. Um, to rely, for example, in, a, in analysis, you can uh, check uh, our analysis tools, the ones we offer in GF Bio, uh, but for that you will need to upload your data, of course, for analysis. But it's very interesting because uh, there, with these tools, you can uh, statistically explore through visualization, through overlay to transformation, statistical analysis or modeling your data and, and really make, make most of the analysis. Regarding these three, um, points and steps I would just like you for a second to consider right now about your practices regarding your research data. How do you store your data currently? Do you have any regular backups? Do you have any data policies or guidelines that you are aware of at your institution? And if not, are you planning to ask uh, at your institution about those? Hopefully, yes. And now we reach um, the last step, which is publication. So. What does publishing mean? Well, uh, publishing means that you have your data set or data sets in a trusted repository, that uh, your data have received or really a persistent identifier, such a digital object identifier, for example, which will keep your data permanently connected uh, or to the publication will have it permanently, uh, permanently connected to your data set, which means which is something different from having a new URL. Uh, your persistent identifiers uh, will link your data and the metadata as well to your data set. This is also the important thing to mention. Metadata always has to be linked to really make all your uh, research data produced fair. And uh, there is some uh, authorities where you can actually uh, have a look, and this is one of the ones we recommend, so datasite.org. But of course, I mentioned before, that there are certain a repository and registries where you can rely on, as I mentioned, RE3 or fair sharing, or also you might be aware also of repositories where you can also publish your data, such as the common uh, mentioned uh, lately, Zenodo, but also there is, of course, Dataverse, um, Fixture, uh, not quite fair, but still open, and Mendeley data as well. Uh, Please also consider, as I mentioned in the very beginning, the, the journal where you are planning to submit your data I might also recommend some um, databases for your data and also uh, provide you with more info. What matters here is that you consider to always use a persistent identifier for your data as your ultimate goal is to make your data fair. So please also do consider open access uh, publications. Another reason why you should publish your data, but you are very aware of that. Just make your data out there. Could be either in a journal, could be um, just as a data set, could be um, in Git, whatever you want to publish it, but put it out there for others to, to use it and to reuse it. Um, and just a little summary before we take the break and it's a take on messages. Uh, of course, follow the fair data principle as much as you can. Uh, remember to create your data management plan. It's part of your research data management practice, and you are also doing constantly research data management practice as long as you have research data. And uh, how to do it? Well, you can also rely on us if it's your first time or you are just learning. 
You can also come with your questions, as Ivo mentioned, to our help desk, and we'll be happy to, to help you out. And uh, everything you do every single day, since you began to collect your data, is already uh, part of your research data management. So don't feel discouraged or disheartened if you haven't really uh, have it all together. A small practices with help, collecting all your data, keeping your metadata, uh, naming your files accordingly, following the three to one rule is also good things or good steps for you for research data management. 